Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It was Lenin's favorite childhood story. It's the Iliad of the Blacks. It's America's national epic. She's claimed that God wrote it. She's the little lady who made this big war. She's Harriet Beecher Stowe. It's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Both are the subject of David Reynolds' new book about the two of them, Uncle Tom and Harriet Beecher Stowe. It's titled Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America. David is Distinguished Professor of English and American Studies at the CUNY Graduate Center. His works include the award-winning Waking Giant, America in the Age of Jackson, Walt Whitman's America, and John Brown, abolitionist, as well as scores of articles, op-eds, reviews, and essays. Welcome back, David. It's great to be here again, Doug. Thank you. Congratulations. I've got another insightful and entertaining semester in uh, American history, mainly 19th century history. Enough for a couple of shows. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, we could talk forever about Uncle Tom's Cabin. And, and we're going to spend a half hour doing it. Now, in my notes, I have that the reviews are not in, but in fact, in the mailbox this morning was a review in The New Yorker where... The book is called The Most Fascinating Part of His Lively and Perceptive Cultural History is the Account of How She Did It, How Beecher Stowe wrote the book that and, caused the Civil War. and caused the Civil War. Talk about how you came to write this book. Well, I was approached several years ago by a publisher who said, how would you like to write a biography of a book? I said, what book? Uncle Tom's Cabin. I said, yeah, that would be fabulous. And I started writing it, and I realized how many roots it had, how much uh, it had a life like an individual, but it lived longer than most individuals. And uh, it just coincided with the 200th uh, anniversary of her birth that it came out. It was unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, talking about anniversaries, the, uh, June 14th is the 200th anniversary of her birth. The first installment of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was ser serialized in 40 sections, yeah. was June 5th, 1851, 160 years ago. And 150 years ago, the Civil War started. So how did you match all these stars in terms of anniversaries? Yeah, yeah. well, Doug, it was just, just luck, sheer luck. I started this about five years ago, and it just as the anniversary approached, I said, we have to make it for the 200th anniversary of her birth. You're, you do reviews. You've done re you do reviews for the Times. I just recently read one on Tocqueville, yeah. one on John Brown. If you're a reviewer, can you step back and review your own book? Well, uh, what I would do it is I, I would do it in that what Annette Gordon Reed does in the New Yorker and take off and talk about the influence of culture. This is uh, an example of culture and how culture influences politics. Yeah, talk about and, that. What fascinated me yeah. was all the strains of popular culture that feed into this, and then all the popular culture that comes out. Talk yeah. about what went in and what came out. Well, uh, as I did my research for the book, I found that, that religious elements of culture went in there, anti-slavery elements went in there, sentimental domestic, sensational adventure went in there, uh, erotic went in there. Everything kind of fed right into it incredibly. It was like a, a, a bunch of streams going into a river, and then that river itself spread through the world. Talk about the, the, uh, the title of the book, both the, the main title and, and after, the, after the colon. Mightier than the sword, what are you saying here? I'm saying that uh, a work like Uncle Tom's Cabin in the end uh, was even more, even mightier than violence because over time it was Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and the nonviolent people who really made race a central issue, and in a way they were imitating uh, Uncle Tom. And um, so I'm saying that it's the cultural influences that cause things, and quite often they can have to do, uh, to do with rhetoric and with, with writing. But in a sense, it doesn't happen, the freedom of the slaves, the, yeah. the, the achievement of a goal, without the sword. And in yeah. fact, she helps produce 
the swords on both sides, both feeding into anti-abolitionism, but causing this, as you chronicle yeah. extensively, this tremendous reaction. Talk about that. Yeah, well, uh, at first, her book came out in 1852. The Civil War begins in 1861, nine years later. But in between that, the book galvanized uh, feelings on both sides of the slavery divide, so that, yeah, violence ultimately was the only answer, because slavery became so de deeply entrenched. And so she ends up supporting John Brown, the violent John Brown. And Interesting, she, given and her Christian background, because that know. infuses the book. I know, yeah. So she ends up realizing that only violence will uproot slavery, and she was right. Ultimately, and the battle for America is what? What are they? What were they battling over? And what? What is? Where does the battle continue? Well beyond the Civil yeah, War. Yeah, uh, the battle is simply: are blacks human beings to be respected, and to be tolerated, and to be embraced by society, or are they to be enslaved, or are they to be excluded from society? That's the battle, and she wins the battle in the end, uh, to to some degree at least. I mean, we we still have a ways to go, but. That, that's essentially the, the, the battle. As I read this book, the, the one nagging question was, given all these tentacles and branches that you traced coming out of Uncle Tom's Cabin, is there too much weight on the book? Um, Meaning, is there too much that it's done, in a sense? Well, in a way, it, it, it becomes scattered, the book uh, be kind of goes everywhere and it, c it becomes distorted and it can becomes used in cartoons and advertisements and everything. And, and in a way, uh, uh, it becomes, uh, people rely on it too much and refer to it too much. So yeah, it becomes di dissipated to some degree. That's okay, talk, talk about what went in. Talk about, you, you, you articulated yeah. all of these influences. What, what motivates her to write this book? Now she claims, at, you know, whether metaphorically or literally, that God wrote it. Yeah, yeah. She uh, was raised in a religious family uh, and a remarkable family of preachers. Her father was Lyman Beecher, the head preacher of New England, and her brother was Henry Ward Beecher, who became the leading preacher of 19th century America. Mm -hmm. She had many sisters and brothers who were equally influential as Henry Ward Beecher, and, and she was even more influential. So it's really, really a religious vision and she goes to church and she has a vision of a black man being whipped. And she goes home, she writes that down, that becomes the culminating scene. But everything that she had written before that, she had written short stories before that, all these popular culture elements fuse together and come together and produce this incredible novel. And this, and this novel, I mean, clearly you read it and it, and it is sentimental, it's melodramatic, but at the same time, it really has tremendous... Strong points: the the, the pathos, the, the the humor, the yes, the, yeah. the 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 appeal to value is is there. It's there's a lot of stuff. I mean, in fact, I mean, you ruined. I mean, no, you ruined. Yeah, yeah. I I spent a considerable amount of time going back to the original book and reading it because yeah. I only had read it yeah. in high school, and yeah, the, you look at it as a modern reader and say, oh man, you know. But at the same time. You missed up with the book. You, yeah. you still do, irrespective of the time. I know, I know. Well, um, it's funny that uh, the, when I reread this book uh, for my class last time, here's a brand new edition that I just came. Yeah, out. no, and then you're going you're gonna to come out with one, yes. and, and it's beautifully illustrated. Yeah, has 145 illustrations, but for the first time, I actually cried because I was uh, I knew everything that had gone into that book um, uh, by writing this book. And for the first time, I really cried when I read the book. And I think that people today will have a good cry and a good laugh when they, when they read Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, is there any possibility that there would be a film made of it? I mean, there was the, the, the famous uh, 1927 silent film, which at that time was one of the most expensive films ever yeah, made. Yeah, very, very expensive. It, uh, the political environment has changed, and you sort of trace, or you do trace, the the sort of the etymology of the term Uncle Tom from the original yeah, character yeah. through its various metamorphoses. Yeah. Talk about that element of it, how yeah. that meaning has changed and how as you read the book, when you go back to the book, Uncle Tom is not Uncle, an Uncle Tom. No, no, no. He's a 40-year-old man or so, uh, muscular. Um, he saves a white girl from drowning. He's a family man. He's strong. He's not weak whatsoever. He's gentle and compassionate, but right. he's not weak at all. 
and yet over time in stage plays he was portrayed as a feeble old fool and that distorted uh, the Uncle Tom figure and produced what the Uncle Tom of today. Yeah, and, and it wasn't only whites who looked at the Uncle Tom as the sort of the step it fetch it character, right. but blacks used it as a pejorative internally in their discussions about the actions of other blacks. Yes, I mean, they that's did. A, I mean, that, that's the nigger word. I mean, yeah, yeah, calling exactly. Somebody exactly. An Uncle exactly. Tom. Yeah. yeah. Well, James Baldwin called it a bad novel because. A lot of the uh, black militants uh, of the 20th century wanted a more militant view of blacks, and so it became a very pejorative term, uh, particularly during the Civil Rights Movement. But um, still, nonviolence won. Yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, you look at the parallels between Martin Luther King and his approach of direct action but civil disobedience and you see an Uncle Tom-like character in the, in the original, if you will. That's right. Martin Luther King was often compared in his own time with Uncle Tom, but he didn't mind the comparison because he admired the real Uncle Tom. So uh, the, the, the society would have benefited by having you written this book uh, a couple of decades ago. I guess so, I yeah. know, know. What was the single element of this book that made it the greatest selling novel of the 19th century it and one yeah. that you trace all I mean you know I mean Lenin's favorite childhood yeah. story you know the serfs in Russia talk about these resonances and ramifications of this book well it was the first book published in China in um, uh, and translated in, in, into Chinese uh, it influenced uh, the revolutions in Cuba and in, in Brazil it influenced um, popular culture in so many ways in America. It was made into nine silent films. Cartoons. Talk about talk about more about popular culture in America, and then we'll move on. Okay, yeah. The, the various things. I mean, you point out that there are Mickey Mouse cartoons with Uncle yes, Tom. Yes, yes. There are Bugs Bunny cartoons with Uncle Tom. I, the, the, yeah. You, you, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. You had a really good time writing this book. Oh, it was fun. I mean, you did. It was fun. How many aha moments did you, did you have? I mean, you read the book and you say, ah, at this point, he was reading this and he went, aha. Yeah, yeah. Talk about a couple of those aha moments. Well, I loved it. You can actually watch the uh, Mickey's Meller drama, which is the um, um, uh, Mickey Mouse uh, um, Uncle Tom on, on YouTube. You can watch a lot of these things on YouTube. Oh, Amazing. okay. No, I so, haven't, I haven't so, seen uh, it. I just and that was it. an incredible aha moment. I mean, so many. Every, every moment that I, that I was writing this, I was saying aha. It was just, just incredible. Yeah, and one of the things that struck me is the, 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 the tie-ins in merchandising. You think of that as sort of a modern marketing business school yeah. phenomenon, but coming almost with immediately upon publication of the book, you've got all kinds of things from spoons to mugs to I know. T shirt. I mean you have Jigsaw the whole puzzle. Jigsaw. Yeah. Go ahead, go. Oh just everything, you know, as you said, the mantelpiece screens, uh restaurant dishes in Paris, uh woolen stockings in London, you know, every everything. You know, just it, it was incredible. What 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 caused this this universal resonance here. What was it about the Feeling, book? Emotion. And you've read it. Uh, emotion, read it. emotion, Ma making people cry and laugh. Emotion, emotion. It's just if you read this book, you you know it's amazing. Yeah, and 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 in a sense, it's Feeling. really universal. Yeah, it yeah, really but also it's and it's but it's got suspense as well. I mean, yeah. the, the chase yeah. of Eliza and George. Yeah, and you've yeah. got the two plot lines. You've got sort of. Them moving north and escaping, and Tom moving yeah, south yeah, and exactly. into slavery. One plot, the northern plot, in which uh, Eliza and George Harris escape north, is one of triumph and suspense. Yeah. The other plot is is one of sorrow and tragedy. And they and but they, but they work together. I mean, even novelistically, she puts it together in such a way that the two stories really do work, and in some ways they do intertwine. So yes, it's yes. not. In some ways, I had remembered the reviews when we when we when I read it, you know, in, in my school days, that this was, you know, old and sentimental and oh, I know, yeah, and yeah all yeah. of that stuff. And then you read it, and it's it, it's quite different. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 very realistic in many ways too. She's a realistic writer, and she's not she's not really that sentimental, despite the emotion. It's not really that sentimental. 
Now, uh, critics both at the time and then subsequently have, have really called into question some of our quote-unquote scholarship. And one of the things, the beauties of the Internet, is that a couple of years after writing uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, she writes The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is sort of a, an intellectual and bibliographic defense of what she wrote. Talk yeah. about the key, because in some ways the key is more virulently anti-slavery and intriguing without the plot line than the novel was. I know. Well, she goes through the key, and she uh, says that most of these characters were based on real-life figures, and she shows how uh, deeply rooted in American reality the horrors of slavery were at that time. And the key is an amazing anti-slavery uh, document, a collection of facts about slavery that sold very well in its day, and it was just utterly shocking, shocking to people who read the key. What was the most disturbing thing that you ran across in your research of the book? Well, I mean, we talked about sort of the glories of the aha moment, sort of the intellectual discovery of, yeah. and you could see it as you're reading plays and yeah. the drama too. What, what just, just got I, you down? I was horrified by the slave narratives that she wrote, the, narrative, the histories of the slaves. I was just horrified by them, and, and they, they really depressed me even to this very day. And so clearly, very, very sad. Ooh. Very sad. And, yeah. and, and again, available on the internet. And some of the ones that she goes back to are really, you know, very, very powerful. I know. I, I almost don't like to talk about them. They're, 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 they're just horrible. Now, yeah. so she writes the book, and, and, you know, she gets all this acclaim, both domestically and internationally. I mean, it's sold hundreds of thousands yeah. of copies, not uh, immediately, yeah. not only in the United States, but in Britain. And in fact, yeah, the yeah. world sales, you know, rivaled the American sales. Yeah. And now, they, I, I read some of the estimates, they're talking about seven and a half million I volumes. Yeah. And then in the 19th century, lots of people didn't read, so they had it read to them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the audience must have been huge. It was huge. They say there were 10 readers for every uh, purchases of the book because they used to read this aloud to their families. So you talk so, about, you know, a million yeah, copies yeah. multiplied by 10, that's 10 I know, million. Yeah. And, yeah. In, in a, in a country whose population is relatively small compared yeah. to today. Yeah, so they didn't have Everybody TV. read it? They couldn't, they couldn't watch TV back then, so they, they read Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it's amazing. Yeah. And you then trace the sort of, you know, going back to your title, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America, Talk about the, the, the different or disparate impacts it has both in the North, generally speaking, yeah. and the South, generally speaking. What happened? Well, in the North, before the novel appeared in 1852, the anti-slavery movement was very weak and divided. But this really galvanized anti-slavery feeling in the North. And it helped, helped give rise to Lincoln and the Republican Party. In the South, it made the South very defensive. And it created a whole pro-slavery backlash in the South. Yeah, you had all these anti-Uncle yeah. Tom novels. Now, yeah. in some ways, going back again to your title, she creates a situation that really polarizes, if yeah, you know your argument, does. polarizes public opinion over the issue and then almost inevitably leads to, with other factors, obviously. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. not monocausal, leads to the Civil War. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know... So mightier than the sword, yes, but the sword was necessary. Now, the sword was necessary. I mean, you were a professor of English and you know and, and history. Are there any other novels that come to mind that have had the immediate real world yeah. impacts as well as these rather substantial derivative impacts? Both in the short term, mid term, and long term. Is there no, anything that no, there, approaches there, that? There's nothing. The only other document is the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, but they're not novels. Right. I yeah. mean, in and, and then the Bible, in fact. Yeah, I, the I, Bible. I, the Bible. I mean, it was the second largest selling book. To the Bible, yeah. To the Bible. Yeah, yeah. And and, and, yeah. and I'll claim that it was written by God. I guess hopefully it was metaphoric because yeah. then it would have to go into the biblical canon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? What else are you up to? What uh, other characters are out there that, that sort of are rattling around in your brain that come out of this? Because there's some, you know, 
after you read enough David Reynolds, yeah. there's little snippets of, you know, yeah. little short pieces of the earlier stuff. So you've got John Brown in there. Yeah. You've got a yeah. little bit of Whitman in there. Yeah. Where, where do you go from here? Well, good question. I mean, I, I'm thinking of writing um, I, uh, our narrative history of the American Enlightenment going back in time a little bit and comparing that to what Oh, people like Sarah Palin and other people. Are oh, that. so you're going to bring in, you're going to, you're going to yeah. contemporize it? Yeah, I was thinking of doing that, yeah. Oh, talk, talk a little more. I mean, well, I, I, I want to get into this head a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, basically, uh, the right wing has really distorted history in a lot of ways. It's the kind of thing I, I, I'd rather not talk about until okay. I've actually formed it. Okay, way. okay. But there's so many characters here that are they're just interesting that I'd love to get in, into. D.W. Griffith is one of them. I mean, you know, just... Okay. Yeah, okay. Let's 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 talk about yeah. D.W. Griffith and the and 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 the movies because coming out of the South were all these anti-Tom novels, right. and then one of the authors who gained fame was this guy Dixon. Yeah, yeah. Who wrote the Klansman, which yeah. is the basis of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about sort of that 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 novel, right? And it's production as the movie, and the movie's impact. I mean, because that movie had a tremendous impact in forming American attitudes. I mean, I, I remember reading a story, Woodrow Wilson, watching yes. it, applauding it, and saying it was like his, lightning in a bottle or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. history talk, made by lightning, yeah. Talk, talk about sort of this perverse consequence of the writing. Yeah, I know. Well, what happened is that during the Jim Crow era, Uncle Tom's Cabin was considered a very threatening novel because supposedly it unleashed blacks on American society. So The Klansman by Dixon was written against Uncle Tom's Cabin, and uh, Birth of a Nation was based on The Klansman. And Birth of a Nation influenced uh, cultural attitudes after that. I, I mean, it's astounding if yeah. folks haven't seen Birth of a Nation. It is just astounding. It's astounding in several ways. I mean, it's astounding as a piece of cinematic art, but it's it's also astounding in terms of the values and distortions of history that it produces they, and that become the history for a lot of people. They have a scene of, of uh, the KKK. The KKK become the heroes of... of and these uh, the black... I mean, yeah. talking about stereotypes, these black men, you know, ravaging white women, it seems yeah, like I there's, know. This, I know. there's this psychological problem. And that gives rise to a real-life rise of the KKK, uh, in the 1920s and 30s and everything like that. So again, and, and you influ have... It, it influences culture. Yeah, see, what, yeah. what's fascinating about the book, and, and you keep coming back to that, is the mutual interaction of these works and culture, that they yeah, are both yeah. the product of it, yeah. but also, even more importantly, that they, they create whole realms of quote-unquote reality that we don't see. Exactly, exactly. I mean... Um, a good example recent, uh, recently of how culture influences history is outsiders, um, we often think politics lead, lead history, but culture leads history. Al-Qaeda, which is a very minor cultural group, has dangled Western politics for, for a, you know, a decade mm. now. And um, you know, it's just amazing how culture influences politics. And, but in this case, it's popular culture. Yes, that influences yes, yes, politics yeah, in a way yeah. that you often don't don't think of it. No. Even th those of us who uh, paid to think of it like that. I know, I know, yeah, I know. What about today and Uncle Tom's Cabin? Well, I think it's a wonderful time for us to re reread Uncle Tom's Cabin. And film? Uh, yes, maybe a film. A good, because, a good film. I mean, clearly the 1927 film. film was in many ways a much more uh, congruent piece of work with the book than one might have expected, but yes. still it had its own biases yes, and it stereotypes. Did. It did. What, I mean, if you were asked to, okay, somebody's going to do a movie on Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Martin Scorsese calls up David Reynolds and said, I, I, you know, I was browsing in Barnes and Noble. I saw this book. I read it. I picked up Uncle Tom's Cabin. I want to do the movie. Yeah. What do you advise him? I advise them to stay very true to the book. The book is just amazing with its characterization. It's amazing. And too many of the films uh, make it into a melodrama. It's not really a melodrama. It's quite realistic. And I would advise him to do what he's done in some of his other films of really, really, and keep to the history. Keep to the history, you know. 
This don't, is just a don't good make suggestion. Do I get any money for suggest? Did this uh, cross uh, your mind uh, before? <laughs> because if you if you start uh, proposing, that, could you, would you ever consider writing, for example, a screenplay? I would love to. Sure, I would love. Have to. you ever? Have you ever? Uh, you know, do you have uh, your own novel or screenplay stuffed in some drawers mm. at home? I have my own memoir that uh, a couple of publishers have rejected, but. Uh, <laughs> And I've been approached. We'll talk about that next time. Yeah, I've been approached uh, uh, about doing screenplays uh, and so forth. Uh, even Walt Whitman's America is under consideration by a major company. And so oh, forth. Yeah, interesting. Again, I don't want to talk about it, but uh, so yeah, you know. Oh. Yeah. So. This 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 could be good. Yeah. Current impacts. Yeah. Yeah. What 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 reverberations do we sense? around Uncle Tom's Cabin today, 2011. Well, I think if, if people can reach the point that Little Eva, a, a white character in this book, reaches with Uncle Tom, Harry Beecher Stowe says, your little child is your true Democrat, and she, she reaches out to Uncle Tom. If we can reach that, that sensibility of reaching across the racial divide, then I think we'll come a long, long way. Thank you. And yeah. then I can't wait to... The next book. I, yeah. it's, it's my seminar. You better do it five years. Uh, it takes you to write these things. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, it takes a lot of work, but it's fun. And it's, it's fun reading fun. it. Thank you very much. Thank you. My special thanks to David Reynolds for being a guest on my show. You can celebrate Harriet Beecher Stowe 200th birthday at a book signing with David Reynolds on Wednesday, June 15th at 7 p.m. at the Barnes & Noble at Broadway and 82nd Street. I'm sure you're all over. You're going to be all over the place. Yes, I will. There's a, I'm doing a New York uh, an op-ed for the New York Times on, on June 14th. That'll I'm going to keep in touch with you via email. Thank and, you. Uh, Comment on the reviews. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. Thanks very Thanks much. It's great being here. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.